this is one of these occasions where the speaker actually says, here is someone who needs no introduction and then spends 30 minutes introducing the person. And the truth is, I can't introduce Walter Murch. He's done everything, he's been everything. He is, as Ava Gardner once said to Gregory Peck, her face aglow, he is everything. Um, and uh, if I actually said, are you familiar with any of his films, it would be kind of like saying to Beethoven, so, have you played anything I might have heard of? Um, this is a delight to have him here, and the reason that it is delightful is several fold. First of all, let's see some of his films. Since this is uh, a symposium, next slide please. Uh, no, not that one. As I told you, te technology is my field. Um, these are some of his films, and since I'm actually not getting paid anything for doing this, I just listed the ones I really like. And so if you want to see other ones that he has been instrumental in terms of creating, although this is kind of everything about everything. And then uh, there were several reasons that I particularly wanted to have uh, Mr. Murch come speak with us, and that is that um, there is so much similarity, as we suggested a little bit for those of you with whom uh, I spoke last night during the filmmaking. Let me see the next slide, please, Brian. Um, there is so much similarity that we overlook between what filmmakers, and especially very thoughtful filmmakers like Mr. Murch and Mr. Coppola did in terms of this particular film that is related to our work as lawyers, particularly with regard to what we see in a community that is so dedicated to collecting images that are decontextualized or collecting sounds that are similarly decontextualized and then that are put into a narrative that is constructed from the perspective of the person who's doing the collecting. And as I think I mentioned to you last night, uh, we're talking about people here who work for government or for corporations or for the NSA and who are putting these images together with a perspective in mind. Uh, giving rise to that old aphorism that if you're a hammer, everything in the world looks like a nail. And so you wind up having narratives that are constructed in terms of our own work that are absolutely, completely, and totally false. And that's the problem you obviously illustrated in writ large in terms of the conversation, uh, which I still consider to be one of the great films about the problems of collecting, using, and putting into some kind of structure that may be completely erroneous, uh, these, these collected films, or these collected images. Uh, the other thing that I find particularly interesting is in terms of talking to a self-defined sound man about a film involving another self-defined sound man, people who basically are constructing ideas about facts and about individuals from s recorded sound imagery. Um, I am put in mind of the fact that the NSA is collecting on us our sounds, that is, our telephone conversations and our uh, perhaps written messages, but the ideas in terms of what they're doing with them is very much the, the same kind of thing. Um, so you have this general notion of um, it, there is a very, very strong subjective element involved in both Mr. Murch's work and in the work that we ultimately are assessing as attorneys about people who are collecting images. And then looking at the next slide very quickly, um, I think that we wind up seeing a real comparison. I thought this was an amazingly uh, candid comment that is specifically that once you become a filmmaker, you become a snoop. And those are the kinds of people that we're ultimately looking at. Um, so I will just repeat something that I said yesterday for those of you who didn't hear it because I wanna be absolutely candid about this. Some lawyers go through life wanting to argue in the Supreme Court I have gone through life wanting to sit on a small stage with Walter Murch, and now I'm going to get to. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I've, been, I've lived in the Bay Area since uh, 1969, um, and so it's great to finally be here. I actually had an apartment a few blocks away 
uh, from Hastings, but this is the first time I've been inside. Um, the, the context of the film, um, in, in my own case, I remember a conversation I had in kindergarten with a fellow student um, in which I was trying to understand why we couldn't read each other's thoughts. Why was the universe constructed so that if I think something, you can't understand it? Um, so this has been a concern of mine from uh, long ago, and uh, it was a great privilege to be able to work with this subject matter in the conversation, and also to a certain extent in the, a film that was made a few years previously, George Lucas's THX 1138, and I think we're gonna run a clip from that. The context out of which the conversation was made was that Francis was an executive producer of THX, uh, he encouraged George to turn this student film that he had made into a feature film, and George and I then collaborated on the screenplay of THX, and we were all ex-film students. So we, we had all gone to film school a couple of years earlier, we had moved up to San Francisco to try to get away from what we understood as a stifling influence of Hollywood at the time, a, a Hollywood, I should add, that was in a certain sense in decline because the old studio system was uh, beginning to come apart and no new paradigm had formed it. But what we wanted to do here in San Francisco was to, st was to make commercial films, films that could run in theaters, but make them the way we had been making student films, which is to say, with a certain amount of freedom and a, a, a great amount of cross-fertilization of uh, ar artistry and technology so that if you were a screenwriter, there was no reason that you couldn't also be a film editor or a sound designer or a producer, or which is what our experience at film school was. Francis started writing the conversation in that milieu um, he had not yet become a success uh, in 1968, at the same time that George was uh, beginning to write the story of THX 1138. We um, finished THX and presented it to the financing studio Warner Brothers, who not only did not like the film, they didn't like any of the other projects that we had uh, proposed to them among which was The Conversation and The Black Stallion and Apocalypse Now and a number of other films that eventually did get made under other auspices. So we were thrown into a certain degree of um, turmoil because uh, of the, the, uh, the lack of funding. And it was at this point that Francis got a proposal from Paramount Studios to direct a gangster film, uh, The Godfather, and it, this was the last thing that he wanted to do. He wanted to get away from Hollywood, he didn't want to do Hollywood films, but there was no alternative to it because of the financial bind that we were in, and so he took the job and uh, applied all of his resources to the film made it a personal film in a sense, much more than it would have been under the auspices of any other director. And the success of that film allowed the conversation to get made because it wouldn't have been made otherwise. There was, there was a uh, conference a number of years ago in which Francis was asked about the film and why we don't make films like that anymore. And he said, well, we never made films like that. Uh, th that kind of, the kind of film it is, it requires a very specific set of circumstances for it to be uh, financed. And those circumstances came to be with the success of The Godfather because Paramount wanted to make Godfather part two. And as, as uh, a means to that end, Francis said, well, I want to do the conversation in between. The, uh, the 
trick of that, though, was that the schedule was very tight. So when he came to me uh, and proposed that I edit the film, at that point I'd written the screenplay for THX and I'd done the sound on The Godfather and THX, The Rain People, uh, and some other films that we had made. But um, he said, well, you're a sound man and Harry Call is a sound man, so why don't you edit the film? You, you know what these people are like because you're one of them. And I, I, Francis, am going to have to leave this. I, I can shoot the film, but then I'm going to have to plunge into Godfather Part Two. So I'm going to give you, you do it, and just report to me how it's going. And we'll have a screening every six weeks or so. And hopefully that's how we will proceed. And that, that's pretty much what happened. There were some wrinkles along the way that I can talk about, but uh, I had a great deal of autonomy in the construction of the film um, because of who Francis is. He, he is a director who delegates a tremendous amount of responsibility to the various heads of departments of, on the films that he works, much more so than maybe any other director that I've worked with. And that was the case. It, it happened to be the first feature film that I had edited. I had done a couple of um, short films before that, some uh, short documentaries, educational films, and I'd worked on the sound of some feature films. But it was a big uh, responsibility uh, to, to do this as a, the first editing film, and also because now the expectations, because of the success of The Godfather, were very high that this film uh, should deliver. In fact, when it came out, it, it won the grand prize at Cannes uh, that year, a film festival in France, but it was not a financial success. It, people didn't go streaming to see it. Uh, it, it got critically very good uh, reviews, and it uh, was nominated for Best Picture along with Godfather II, which was, came out the same year, 1974. Um, the, the, the questions <coughs> that, it, that it examines are fantastic, uh, relevant today. In fact, even today, looking at the film, which is now uh, 40 years old, there's very little of it that appears dated. You know, some of the costumes, of course, are dated, um, but there's much uh, of the film, compared to other films made at the time, which you immediately look at and say, no, that's 40 years old. This, this film somehow escapes that, and it, it's mysterious to me how it does that, and, but I think partly it's because it's dealing with questions, which are profound questions, and looking at them in a very unusual way. Harry Call uh, interested Francis, he created that character, because he wanted to examine the life of somebody who in an ordinary film would be completely tangential to the story. In, in an ordinary film, Harry Call would appear, but he would have a scene maybe two or three minutes long in which he delivered the tapes um, and you would acknowledge him and get a glimpse of what he was like, and then he would exit and the story would go off in another direction. And Francis said, no, I want to, where does that guy go? Why did he come here? How did it happen? And where does he go? What's his life like? So he was interested in a kind of character study of a character who is not very cinematic and on a certain level not very sympathetic. He is a very private individual. His life is very constrained, kind of constipated, intensely uh, focused on his own privacy, has you know, a girlfriend, but it's a clearly very uh, stilted uh, relationship which comes to an end uh, in the film. And not somebody that you would think, hey, let's make a feature film about this guy. So, Francis described the film at one point as a combination of Hermann Hesse and Hitchcock. Uh, and, and in fact, the character in Steppenwolf is named Harry Holler. And in the original screenplay, Fra uh, Harry's name was Harry Collar. Just changed the H to a C. Francis thought that was too on the nose because of 
the telephone, so he changed it to Harry Call, C-A-L-L. -L. But then when the script was being retyped uh, at one point, the person who retyped it misspelled C-A-U-L, and Francis immediately zeroed in on it because he knew what a call was. A call is a membrane that, it, that wraps the fetus in the womb, and occasionally the, the child is born wrapped in the call, which is a semi-transparent fabric. And he thought this was great because it sounds like call, but isn't call. And in fact, in one scene, Harry spells his name, C-A-U-L. And that provided an inspiration for the uh, look of many of the things in the film. The transparent raincoat that Harry wears throughout the film is a call. And whenever he's under pressure or whenever something dramatic is about to happen, uh, it is seen through these semi-transparent uh, plastics or glass, uh, such as when the, the first image of the bloody hand comes through this semi-transparent glass. When Harry is under pressure at his party he, by uh, Moran, the, his rival, he retreats behind a sheet of plastic that is not explained, it's just there. In, in the thing, but it's a uh, way for him to get out of the gaze, in, 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 in a sense, to retreat into a semi-private state. And um, in the end, the tragedy that befalls this character is that his search for privacy, uh, relentless in the end, uh, drives him into a kind of madness uh, in which he, looking for the bug, he destroys his apartment and presumably destroys something inside himself as well. It's not uh, very uh, encouraging to think about what happened to Harry Cole in the, uh, in the months after this film is, is over. And it forces us as an audience to wonder w w what's the subject of this conference, which is what is the value of privacy? And um, I, I was reminded of something I read uh, not long ago, which was a comment by Cardinal Richelieu, who was sort of a Dick Cheney to Louis XIV, who said uh, on this subject, give me six sentences written by the most honest of men, and I will find something in there with which to have him hanged. So it's talking about what uh, uh, Terry was just referring to, taken out of context, something that is entirely innocent can be reinterpreted as something menacing. And the security apparatuses of the states of Louis XIV uh, or East Germany or the United States today and in the past uh, have always relied upon this ability to, uh, when push comes to shove, to use these things either as an overt bludgeon with which to uh, hit you with, or as an implied threat that we could do this, therefore you are implicitly under our control. And the, uh, the, the other analogy which relates to the creative process, which also requires a certain degree of privacy, is uh, if, you, if you can cast yourselves back to those times when you were five years old, six years old, and playing with your friends, if you were creating an imaginary world in which you were playing a fort, this is the fort and I'm the this and you're that and let's imagine that this and that, that to, in order for this to work, there needs to be a certain amount of privacy. If your parents come into the room and watch you playing this game, it chills it, it spoils the, the fun of it. Um, and the other part of that, though, which has to be taken into the balance, is that it's also not as much fun if your parents aren't in the house. That the best thing when you're playing these kind of games is to be playing in one room and to know that your mother is in the kitchen, you know, in case something goes wrong. But you don't want her in the room with you because that spoils it too. So there's a question of distance by the authorities not too close, but not absent either. And so I think as a culture, we have to find where the, our comfort level is.
for each of these, these things for society to work. It clearly doesn't work if the authorities are present all the time uh, with the Cardinal Richelieu threat impending on us. On the other hand, uh, society doesn't work if uh, the authorities are completely absent because then it devolves into a kind of Somalia. So um, I think that's uh, all I should say right now uh, and I'll just turn it back to Terry and uh, we can uh, proceed from there. There are a couple of things that you had mentioned that I um, immediately um, th thought of. One is the idea of the watcher recorder whose life has really no meaning whatsoever other than that he's watching and recording. And I think about the scene uh, in the warehouse, post-warehouse, when um, th there is the sex slash love scene and it isn't the people who are involved, Harry and Meredith, uh, it's the recording that's going on in the background. And um, I, I was so, thought I was rendered thoughtful by the comparison to the lives of others in the sense that you have, which I assume is probably something that was very much influenced by what, what you guys were thinking about, but you have this person who's, who is a watcher and a listener there whose existence is absolutely stripped down and who ultimately then defines his own life by what's being watched and listened to. And I found that to be a really kind of um, profound sure. thought about looking at some of the people we cross-examine or some of the people whose work that we ultimately look at and you know, kind of think about, well, to what extent is our importance defined by what we're doing in terms of listening to your lives. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. Our, our conception at the time of Harry um, was that he was somebody whose emotional life got stunted for some reason in mid-adolescence, and he wound up in a profession in which that didn't matter, which was the listener. And he began, and his, his, his mistake was that he began to fall in love with the girl or the image of the girl that he had in his mind of uh, who was being recorded. But he had none of the uh, mature uh, understanding of what you would do with that. And he wound up, as it turns out in the end of the film, misinterpreting what the whole conversation was about because of that uh, misplaced emotional attachment. So it's, um, it's a very provocative um, arena. And, and what we thought happened to Harry at, at the end is that the circumstances of this particular story forced him uh, to grow up, in a sense, to emerge out of this uh, call, but without any defenses. That, that, his, that he, he emerged too quickly uh, without any of the, the knowledge of how you navigate in, in the, this other world. And uh, as a result, his life was, uh, had this tragic turn to it. One, one of the techniques that we use as filmmakers when we're presented with a character like Harry Cole, who, as I said, is unsympathetic. Well, he's interesting, but we made him interesting. He's not somebody that if you sh saw a list uh, of him compared with the heroes of you know, two dozen other films, you wouldn't pick him out as a good subject. But what you can do as filmmakers under those circumstances is make the film, tell the film from a single point of view, which is to say, Everything in the conversation is either from Harry's point of view, he's looking at that, or you're looking at Harry. In other words, there is no scene in which two other characters go up, up, off and talk about Harry. So as a result, you never, let, you never let the audience get off the hook. They either have to watch the film or turn the film off, leave. And after a while, there's a kind of um, Stockholm syndrome, in a sense, that just the persistence of 
watching this person's life presented with hopefully a certain amount of artistry will eventually make you start to see things the way he or she sees them. And um, it's, it's one of the devices that uh, also got us into a little trouble at the end because what really happened at the end of the film? If, if there is not a what we might call a Perry Mason moment where everyone at the end says, well, what really happened? Well, if it was this and it was that and all that, now I understand. So we couldn't do that because of the construction of the film. Every, it, the realization had to be his own realization, but if he was wrong, how did he make the realization? And that's the unfolding at the end, and if your ears picked it up, there was a difference in inflection in the last repetition of he'd kill us if he had the chance, which is a kind of Cardinal Richelieu uh, phrase. Because if the emphasis is one way, it means that the kids, the young people, are victims of uh, the Robert Duval character. If the influence, is, if the emphasis is different, then they are the perpetrators, and they are preemptively making a strike before he makes a strike. So, arguably, this was a cheat because. Everything up to that point, we, the audience, and Harry have heard it one way, and it's only at the very last that you hear it in this slightly different tone. Um, but that what, it, what, what is implied is that it was that way all along, but Harry, Cole, and the audience, because there is a single point of view there, uh, hear it the way they want to hear it, which is, as a, that this girl is a victim and I, Harry Call, must save her somehow or do something to save her. I think the really amazing part uh, about that is its connection. And again, this is for me in terms of trying to apply it to what is happening today and now is the extent to which we again think about what the NSA is collecting, what people are collecting are visuals, are, I'm sorry, are sounds by and large. And they are constructing these stories. Very often the constructions, as in the conversation, are visual components. They're visual creations of what is actually in, uh, purely audible. Uh, and that entire stories are being constructed. There's the great trial story about the, um, I think it's called the Ninja Turtles case about the people who were arrested uh, for being terrorists and who knew absolutely nothing about terrorism, but the facts had been put together in such a way so that the people who arrested them decided that they were terrorists and the guys who got arrested were so confused that they wound up getting in and telling a story that would go along with what the uh, arresting officers thought was true and they based it on what they had seen in one of the Ninja Turtles movies. So that there is this whole component of to what extent, in terms of our work, are we still so limited by what it is that the other guy actually thinks is the fact and what he ultimately knows? I wanted to ask you one other thing, though. I have been um, stealing relentlessly, and you mentioned falling in love, and I've been falling in love with all these beautiful images that you, you put together and this, this past couple of weeks. And um, it struck me so much in terms of pulling out images that I thought were particularly meaningful, how much uh, of what is on the screen is consistent with the writing of the particular period. And I'm, there's a lot of apocrypha, obviously, about things that you guys knew and read and that you did at the time and that influenced you. And there's a story that you had, uh, that is you personally, had said we're gonna use some special equipment that we got from you know, a high-tech agency, and um, so what's the backstory on what you really were reading and knowing and thinking during this period about the cultural and political environment at large, would you say? Well, I mean, the, the biggest uh, cinematic influence on the conversation was Antonioni's film Blow Up, which is, talks okay. about similar things, but from a photographic point of view. It's a uh, photographer in London who sees a, um, takes a photograph, but then circumstances that evolve within the context of the film 
force him to re-examine the photograph, and there's evidence, very grainy but, and, and ambiguous, but arguably that's evidence of, of something that takes the story off in another direction. So that was, again, very overt in Francis's mind, that, that he was using Blow Up as the inspiration uh, to make a film, but from an audio uh, perspective about, about a sound man. So um, I was reading um, Hesse at the time. The, 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 you know, that was not unfamiliar. When Francis talked about that, that was not unfamiliar to me. He was very popular, and still is, but particularly at that time. And um, as, I, as I said, we had just finished a year or so earlier making THX 1138, which uh, fed uh, into the same sort of concerns, in fact, made many of them more overt. It's a completely uh, sur uh, surveyed uh, society in which cameras are within medicine cabinets and nobody uh, at any private moment is not under surveillance. Both films, The Conversation and THX, have confession booth scenes, and arguably the, ch the church used, uh, at, at the apex of its power, there was a whole network where confession booths were a way of peeking into the private thoughts of the population, and reports were filtered back from all over Europe to the Vatican about what was going on, and the confession booth was a way of opening up the privacy of the skull and digging in there. And so the concern over the moral sanctity of the individual parishioners was, in a certain sense, secondary to what was actually going on in the world. And, and given the technology of the time, that was the only way to do it. And there is a similar, uh, there's a scene in, in a conversation where Harry goes into the confession booth and the camera tracks in closer and closer on the ear uh, of the listening uh, priest um, who is listening to what Harry says, who is concerned about the fact that these kids, uh, these two young people might be uh, in danger. And uh, in THX, there's a similar scene where the, the main character, played by Robert Duvall, goes into a phone booth and talks to a roboticized voice that is pre-programmed with certain uh, catchphrases. Given what the con person confesses, then you know, using a branching tree technology, go to this answer. Yes, I understand. And um, so uh, there was a pervasive. Uh, uh, faceless bureaucracy. There was no one in charge of the world in THX, which gets back to so something of the NSA issue. You know, uh, Given the gigantic amount of information, who could ever be in charge of it? And that's one of the dangers of it, is that it, it's, it's impossible. And uh, that's, a, that's the world in THX, is that there is no dictator, there's no president, there's no chairman of the board or anything. It's just a vast bureaucracy that is filtering all of this information and acting with that information up to the point that too much money is being spent, at which case they kill. Uh, that's how TA, the character gets off in the end and manages to get punch his way through to the surface of the earth from this underground world, is that the budget runs out. You know, our pursuit of him just not, we can't spend any more money, let him go, who cares? And uh, so that's sort of the milieu out of which all of this happened. I can't imagine a, a world in which there would be constant surveillance, people would be very focused on the budget and that there would be a thought in the sense that we are going to use information to control government behavior based upon the budget, that kind of far-flung thinking eludes me. Um, <laughs> let's stop titillating these people and show them this great medicine cabinet scene. What do you say? Um, sure, this is a clip from THX, uh, which is this um, uh, moment in the film, uh, among several, where every time you opened up a, a medicine cabinet 
And it was, a, it was a highly drugged society. Everyone was on some equivalent of Prozac, uh, which is how they endured living underground like this. And, um, but if you opened up a medicine cabinet, a voice would say, what's wrong? And you would address it. I uh, just, uh, from a, we're used to these kind of images now that you just saw, uh, but this was actually the first time that s uh, actors or people on screen were in an environment where there was just this, these banks and banks of monitors. Uh, now every news program that you turn into has these banks of monitors in the background, but at the time this was, uh, this had never been seen before. Well, and there's the phenomenal aspect that, again, I think is used now in the sense that it's even used in advertising, but that is so significant here in terms of the using the camera coming from behind the medicine cabinet so that you're actually, there's an entity behind. Yeah. And, um, I mean, this, this makes one think, again, of the end of the conversation in which there is such a um, sense that of this aggressive, living force that is doing this kind of monitoring in the sense that it's always there and you may not know exactly where it is is it in the walls is it in the ceiling is it but it is is it moving can you capture it that is that is always there and that's available i would actually like to see if you don't mind i'd like to see an, the other clip that I had mentioned to you from THX, which is the, a, a clip that really does relate very much to the idea of privacy in the sense of you guys really got this one bang on in, the, in that the most intimate moments, and we were talking about in the 70s, a society that's very focused on intimacy, and that that's certainly a fundamental part of the what Harry falls in love with, but also that takes place in your phenomenal warehouse scene sure. in the conversation, but here's the notion of intimacy being invaded again. So, guys, can we see number two, the number two scene from THX? So uh, lovemaking was forbidden in this world. So they basically what happened is sh uh, she, uh, the, the girl named La, L-U-H, uh, began reducing the, pro you know, I forget what the, but it was kind of Prozac. Uh, she began reducing his uh, medication. She had come off the medication because she wanted to get out with him and get up to the surface of the world, get out of this world. 
And so one thing led to another, and they made love, which is not allowed, but it was clearly being photographed or, or recorded at the time. So, And that was her job, was to be one of the people who monitor things. So she, uh, among, you know, on top of everybody, should know exactly what was possible or not. Harry Call and the dilemma of the reasonable expectation of privacy. What do you think is private if you really do understand that absolutely everything can be accept, accessed? Um, what would you think about looking at this masterwork of sound in terms of talking about voyeurism and the voyeuristic society and the pleasure and weird pleasure, weird responses of looking for the opening sequence of um, the conversation. Could we talk about that for a moment? Sure. About clip one, gentlemen. It's actually one of the uh, places in the film where you do get a sense of the datedness of it because homelessness was a new problem uh, at that time. And so she stopped and looked at a homeless person and would say, oh, look, that's terrible. And then she has a little uh, observation about how homeless people must keep themselves warm using newspapers. And when there's a newspaper strike, then homeless people die unintended consequences of newspaper strikes. But, uh, you know, a, a similar scene photographed today, w it would be hard to justify somebody commenting upon an individual homeless person like that. This is so amazing, though, because it uh, makes one think of the language that is uh, so prevalent in some of the really beautifully written dissents of this period, whether you're talking about the dissent in Oliver the Open Fields case, or you're talking about the uh, recorded conversation with the loved one that is in uh, the, the White case. But y you have the whole, I, one, one of the most beautiful passages refers to the fact that uh, the thing that's so amazing about uh, the nature of intimacy and what should be preserved is that there can be incredibly banal conversation. And every time I listen to Cindy Williams babbling in this particular scene, I think, well, now we're hearing it 
for the banal conversation. But this is, in fact, the thing that we're talking about during this period in terms of law essentially wanting to do. And um, the, the implication that is involved by you in terms of constructing the sound that, uh, as we know from THX, it's such a comment on what voyeurs we all are. But the, as soon as you get the sound bubble in the opening sequence, we are all so dirty. We are so involved in this. And um, was, how did that come about? How how'd you decide that we're going to hear this kind of, um, you know, diegetic sound, but lo and behold, it's going to be not natural sound. It's going to be something that is a recorded sound, and we know that because of the bubble. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, a, a dramaturgical problem, te a technical problem was uh, twofold, which is how did Harry actually record these sounds? How did he, uh, later on in the film, retrieve a sound buried underneath music? And, um, and how do you convey to an audience the fact that sound has gone out of focus, so to speak? And uh, because it's not, it wouldn't have been enough simply to fade it out because we wouldn't understand is that because of uh, an atmospheric problem or is it a problem with the equipment or did, the, you know, so I had to come up with a, uh, a, a signature, really, to convey all of these things. And this was 1972, and I knew about the soon-to-be emerging technology of digital sound, uh, which, of course, has enabled the whole NSA thing to work. And uh, I supposed that, uh, let's say that Harry is such a genius that he himself has invented digital sound before anyone else. And so all of his little secret equipments are, are, have digital stuff buried in them. Because technically, if, if you were even to conceive of being able to do what he does, erasing music and revealing a voice behind it, digital cancellation is the only way that you could do that. And I knew that at the time, even though it, it hadn't been invented yet. Um, so uh, I then had the challenge of how do I convey digital quality without there being any digital sound? And so I went to a synthesizer. Um, a, it wasn't a Moog synthesizer, it was an ARP, I think, which was a rival, and uh, introduced a square wave distortion on top of certain sounds and then tweaked that until I got the right blend and then in the final mixing, adjusted that blend to be exactly what I wanted, where it w so that clarity would devolve into a kind of uh, crazy digital hard-edged uh, type of type of sound. But it, it allowed me to do things like you saw at the at just at the beginning of the film, and also deep uh, into the film, maybe half an hour into the film make it conceivable that Harry could erase the music, so to speak, and see one level deeper and hear this crucial line, he'd kill us if he had the chance. I would love to just ask all of my foolish questions for the rest of the afternoon, but we need to let Mr. Merch get back to Mr. Clooney. So uh, do any of you have questions that you want to ask? Hi. Um, okay. My question is technical about something you said in a documentary. You said that editing is a dance of eyes. And in this film, in particular, one of the ways that you create the distance between Harry and his subject is he never looks at anybody straight in the eye. You never edit a shot reverse shot. Was that something that you said, I'm going to do that, or you saw, or is it something I just saw because I've watched the film 20 times? You mean in this particular scene? In, in the whole film of the conversation, there's very few scenes where you do the shot, reverse shot of two people's eyes matching. 
when he's in bed with yeah, Terry Yeah, I mean, Mara. that was uh, uh, certainly something that Francis and Harry and, and Gene Hackman had developed. There, there's one uh, scene particularly relevant to your question, uh, which is he, at the party at his warehouse, he goes off with Meredith, uh, the, the girl from the convention, and she tries to get him to come up with something intimate. <clears throat> and they're alone, uh, way off. The party is at the other end of the room. And he, says, he begins to talk. And the, uh, the camera starts on her uh, and moves to reveal him. Uh, so it's, a, it's an over-the-shoulder shot that becomes the other over-the-shoulder. But as soon as he's too re revealed, it cuts back to her again. And then it does the same thing, and then it cuts back to her again and does the same thing. So in a sense, this is the editorial equivalent of Harry going behind the plastic. That, that the idea of having his full face on camera confessing something intimate, even the film is conspiring in a sense. To, to hide him and uh, to give him some cover. So it was something that Francis and shot that gave you the ability to edit that. Because sometimes when, when you watch a film, you see that was clearly an editorial decision. It was done in the edit versus being done on the day. And I wondered, it, it seems now, what, based on what you're saying, that a lot of that was thought of before shooting even began. Well, yeah, I mean, the, in this particular case that I was just talking about, there was an element of accident, which is that they had, uh, I don't know, five or six takes of this scene, and the, the ballet of camera with dialogue was choreographed, but in one of the takes, it got out of sync. And so the line of dialogue that was on camera, in this rogue take, it was off camera, and that allowed me, thankfully, to do this uh, little pirouette with these three shots in a row of revealing and then hiding, revealing and hiding, revealing and hiding. Uh, if, they hadn't, if there hadn't been that one mistaken uh, take, then I couldn't have done what I did. Thank you. You bet. Other questions? Do you have a question? I, I was curious as to whether um, at the time, if any of the cast, or I guess specifically Gene Hackman, talked about having been changed by um, you know, immersing himself in this character and engaging in this whole uh, You mean specifically Gene Hackman, or? Yeah, just b being the, 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 the voyeur. The, being the yeah, I mean, th this was an extremely hard role for Gene Hackman to play because it was so very much not like him. And, uh, and he's somebody who gets into character. And in all of the films that he had done up to that point and, and afterwards, there was always a, a, an explosive scene in which some of the steam that got bottled up would allow it to be released. But there's, there's almost nothing like that in the film. And there's one shot where he tries to go upstairs at the end of the film to, to confront the Robert Duval character, and he's stopped. So there's this little struggle, but tiny, uh, you know. Uh, but that's the only scene like that in, in the film. And it, it, it was very hard on him. And um, it, toward the end of the shooting, and, and the film was abandoned with about eight days of shooting left to do, partly because he just couldn't take it anymore. And Francis also had to go, go off to do post-production, on I mean pre-production on Godfather 2. And there were other scheduling problems, so it was like, all right, well, cancel, stop. And uh, I, was, you know, I sort of said, well, what, what am I supposed to do editorially? And Francis said, well, do the best you can, figure it out, <laughs> and uh, if we need, you know, once we've sorted it out, then we can identify what do we really need, uh, and then we can go back to Paramount and ask them for, uh, you know, to, to do a reshoot. In fact, there w it, it turned out that there was 
one shot that we needed. And one of the things editorially that I, I did was to make Meredith an agent of Robert Duval, uh, whereas she was in the script an agent of Moran, and that in the party what she stole were, were the plans for the MOSFET microphones. And that had nothing to do with the tapes, and yet that, given the fact that we had to condense a huge amount of footage, it seemed much more plausible and dramatically coherent if what she stole was the tapes themselves because Harry had, had not given them up. He was still obsessing over them. And so the Harrison Ford character of a, you know, basically said, go get the tapes to, to Meredith. And so she, she as a spy infiltrated and got the tapes. But we had to sell this idea of the tapes uh, having been gone because that was never shot. And uh, so I went, uh, Francis was busy with Godfather 2. I wound up going down to Paramount and building with Dean Tavalaris a little mini set of a tape recorder and part of Harry's laboratory with the thing. And we got Gene Hackman's brother to come in with a blanket over his shoulder. And we're shooting over the brother's shoulder looking at the tape and then uh, his hand comes up and pulls the uh, spring on the tape uh, uh, reel, it falls apart and it's, it's empty. So that, that's how we convey the fact that it's uh, gone. I, I wish I had kept the camera rolling because we hijacked a camera from a film that was shooting at Paramount at the time just to save money. So we said, can, can we borrow your camera in between your takes? We'll just do this thing over here. Okay, sure. So we were on a corner of this other set shooting our little film, um, and if I had kept the camera running and panned over, I would have seen the director and the star of the movie that was being shot, which was Roman Polanski and Jack Nicholson shooting Chinatown. <laughs> so in one shot, we would have connected up the conversation with Chinatown. <laughs> A little, a little dual paranoia during this, <laughs> this period. Uh, if no other questions, we will thank Mr. Murch so much. It's been a tremendous honor.